I do appreciate the things that Brother Whitten had to say. And I would be careful to express my appreciation to him and the work that he is doing in directing the Brown Trail Preacher Training School and in directing a lectureship such as this. And each of us ought to be careful to tell Eddie that we do appreciate him and his labors in the kingdom and those great principles for which he stands. It is always an honor and a joy for me to be in Fort Worth, Texas and to be at this lectureship and to have the opportunity to address you upon some Bible theme. The subject that has been assigned to me, as Eddie has just said, is Christ and the problems in the home. I think every one of us understand that there are three divine institutions. And of course, our attention this morning is being directed to that divine institution, the home. We oftentimes use such expressions as the fact that the home is the basic unit of society. And I don't think that's an overused phrase. By that, we mean that the home is the bedrock foundation upon which society is built. And when there is something that enters in that destroys the home, then we have problems with society. Even in that early morning of time in the garden eastward in Eden, when Satan came and had his evil influence in the home of Adam and Eve, it brought about the fall of man. For he tempted her to disobey the instructions of God. She influenced her husband to disobey those instructions, and thus man fell. And when you simply pause to think about it, when you realize that when the home has been undermined, that governments of the past have fallen, and students of history can very easily and very quickly point to governments such as that of ancient Persia or Rome and understand that the beginning of the downfall of those great governments was, first of all, the downfall of the home. This is what I want to do this morning, is to just simply point to some of the problems that we have in the home. As those problems relate to three particular areas, we want to say something about the permanency of the home. We want to be careful that we say something about the problems that relate to the participation in the home. And finally, and perhaps as important or most important of all, we want to address ourselves to the purpose that God has given for the home. When we talk about problems in the home, every one of us who are members of the Lord's Church surely ought to be keenly aware of the fact that there are tremendous problems regarding the home today when it comes to this idea of permanency. From the beginning, God ordained that the marriage be a lifetime proposition. We understand that. And when you open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 19 and you begin reading, here are the Pharisees that are questioning Jesus. And let's start with verse 3. It says, the Pharisees came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this cause I shall, uh, uh, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh? Wherefore they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder? They understood the impact of what he just said. Because in verse 7, they said unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? They understood that Jesus said that God's principle from the beginning has been one man for one wife life. And they say, well, if that's God's law, then why did Moses do thus and so? And so he answers in verse 8. He says, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, committeth adultery. We understand that there are reasons, things that can occur that can cause the scriptural putting away of one that one is married to and allow that person to marry again and still be right in the sight of God. I want to be careful that I say that. But I also want to very plainly point out that many times those of us who preach have mounted the pulpit and done a lot of preaching with regard to the exception in Matthew 19, 9, and have not said a lot about the law in Matthew 16, 7, and 8. And God's law for man from the beginning of time is one man for one wife for life. There are exceptions. There are things that intervene. Sometimes there is death. Sometimes there is sin. But nevertheless, that's God's principle upon which the home has been founded. And I'm saying that we as preachers, we as teachers in the Lord's church, we as parents who have that 
awesome responsibility in our home of training our children need to, along the line, be careful that we indoctrinate our children upon the principles of the fact that marriage is supposed to be for life. I'm afraid that too many times that the marriages are entered into too lightly. I'm afraid too often children graduate from our homes, leave our homes, without having the proper values of marriage. Now, we as parents have a responsibility, as I just said, to be careful that we indoctrinate our children. And I believe that parents with the proper exercise can indoctrinate their children to be or to do just about anything in this world that they want them to. If I said to you, or if I began to discuss with you the idea of cannibalism, it automatically become repulsive to you. But you understand there are some people in this world that do not have a repulsive thought within their being when that word is mentioned because of the way they've been trained. Several years ago, oh, maybe 17 and a half or so, I was, as my custom is, reading a magazine one night. A good magazine, Andrew. I think it was Sports of Field. And uh, <clears throat> I like to go to bed on something light, usually. And I was reading an article about Ben East. Ben's dead now. But you remember how prolific his pen was? And Ben had written an article about the four poisonous snakes of North America. And there was an excellent picture, if there can be an excellent picture, of a coiled uh, diamondback rattlesnake. And my little two-and-a-half-year-old girl, Kathy, crawled up in bed with her daddy, looked at the picture of that rattlesnake, and said something that shocked me, Robert. She said, Daddy, I want one. I didn't think I understood her. I said, what? She said, Daddy, I want one. I would have never thought that a child of mine would have ever had such an idea about a snake. Some people say the only good snake's a dead snake. I don't believe that. I believe a dead snake's better than a live snake. But I'm not even sure a dead snake's a good snake. And so when my daughter, when Bill Klein's daughter looks at a picture of a rattlesnake and says, I want something, I said, something's got to be done. Today, if you walked up to her with a rubber snake in your hand, she might slap you because I've done a good job of training her that snakes just ain't no good. Now, I want to tell you something. If I can train her that snakes are like that, I can train her that divorced homes are like that too. I can train her that a divorced home, a home that is torn apart by sin, is the most repulsive thing in all this world. And I'm saying that the home is that basic unit where that message has to be taught. I'd rather get tired of some members of the church saying to me, why don't you preach a sermon on marriage, divorce, and remarriage? Listen, precious, I've preached a lot of sermons on marriage, divorce, and remarriage in my years. But I want to tell you something. If the parents would do their job at home, the gospel preacher would never need to stand and preach the sermon on it because it would have already been preached where it needs to be preached and where the impact can be lasting. So I'm saying that we need to be careful that in the home the divine ideal be taught with regard to the permanency of marriage. The divine ideal has basically been discarded. It's no longer until death separates us, but it's until this thing quits working. You know, Jesus said here in Matthew 19 that whatsoever God hath drawn together, let not man put asunder. How many of us as gospel preachers over the years in conducting marriage ceremonies have uttered those very same words toward the conclusion of that marriage ceremony? That these two that have come before us and have taken their vows are now husband and wife. And what therefore God hath drawn together, let not man put asunder. But I'm telling you that ever since Jesus said it, Marriages have been going asunder all the time. A recent article in Reader's Digest concerning the problems of marriage said that after seven years across the board in America, four out of every ten marriages have already ended in divorce. And that's just after seven years. That's tragic. But the simple fact of it is that that tragedy continues to loom across the breadth, length and breadth of this land and even in the Lord's church where it ought not be so. I said a moment ago, that the divine ideal has been discarded, and with a lot of people it's not until death separates us, but it's until this thing stops working. You know, I'm afraid when we have this idea toward marriage that we never really try to solve the problems of marriage. Our young people need to be taught that they are going to have problems. He who thinks that two can come out of their separate worlds and become joined together and not have any type of problems to exist among them, I think is living in some type of glass world. He needs to understand that they're going to have problems. But when you have problems, what do you do to those problems? 
You solve them. You solve the problems. Now, I've got an automobile parked, um, yeah, back here. If I walked out there after a while and put the key in the ignition and tried to crank that automobile and it wouldn't crank, I may come in here and say, Eddie, we've got car problems. Can you help me? Eddie might say, well, we've got a deacon. We've got an elder that has one of the finest repair shops in all of Tarrant County. And that man might go out and look at the car and say, oh, Bill, you've got a bad battery. I'm put you in the best battery there is for $59.95. What would I say? Put it in. What if he went out there and raised the hood on that car and began to examine it, got his pen and pencil and figured it out for a little while and said, Bill, you've got tremendous problems with that car. The engine just simply needs to be replaced. There's been some type of short in it, and all the electronical gear in that car has been burned up. And you understand that car will tell me when to shut the door, when to shut my mouth, and everything else electronically. And he said, all of that is burned up in it, and it's going to cost you $4,500 to fix it. You know what I'd probably say then, Eddie? I'd say, where's the nearest used car lot? I'd be ready to trade that sucker off, because I wouldn't be willing to put that much money in that car. Now, all of us are that way. But you can't treat your marriage that way. When we have little problems that come along in marriage, well, we solve them, you know. She wrote a check and didn't enter it in the checkbook. You went to balance it, couldn't balance it. Finally, you walk in at her, swell up about twice the size you ought to be. Chew on her for a little while, but a little while later, a little while later, you all get back together. You forgive her. She forgives you for acting like you did. We solve those kind of problems. But then sometimes those problems get bigger, and instead of solving the problem, we just simply divide or dissolve the marriage. That's tragic because that's not according to the pattern. Again, as I hurry down through these thoughts, not only do we have problems in the, in the home concerning the permanency of the home, but we have problems regarding participation. When we talk about participation, immediately our concern is, is the husband doing what he ought to do? And is the wife doing what she ought to do? Are they playing the role properly? You know, the, the wide receiver that lined up behind the quarterback expecting to take a handoff for a runoff left tackle, we'd say he wasn't participating properly. And a lot of times that happens in the home. Well, when we think of participation, we immediately must say, before we even pursue that thought, that there is one guide when it comes to how we are to participate in the home. And it's not Dobson, but it's God. And when we want to understand how is it the husband is to conduct himself, what responsibilities is it that the wife has, then those instructions come to us from God's divine word. And there are people that are trying to destroy that basic unit of society, the home, and they are wise enough to understand that one of the most successful ways that they can destroy that home is by removing God and removing the Bible from the hearts and the minds of the people who make up that basic unit of society. And obviously one of the uh, most successful schemes of Satan has been to destroy the distinctive roles that God has given to men and women. And he's done a very good job of it during the last 20 years or so. There are a lot of people that would simply take the Bible and destroy it in the minds of man, destroy the role of the husband and wife. We're having a lot of problems with that even with regard to our government. We have a lot of leaders up in Washington that have forgotten that righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach unto any people. And somewhere along the line, we need to get people back to remembering that. And so when we talk about participation in the home, we're concerned about God's instructions to those of us who are husbands and to those who are wives. For example, let's look at God's instruction to the man as a husband and some of the things that he is supposed to do. I know the ladies would like to be here to hear this. They always enjoy it as I tell the husband what he's supposed to do to make that home what it ought to be. But you men, listen to me. One of the first responsibilities that the man has to be the kind of husband that God would have him be is to assume the headship or to assume the leadership of that home. That is taught very plainly in such passages as 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 11 or in that paragraph in Ephesians chapter 5 beginning in verse 22. And the relationship of the wife to the husband is the same relationship as the church is to Jesus Christ. And just as the church is to be in subjection to Jesus Christ in all things, so is the woman to be in subjection to the husband in all things. And wouldn't it be some type of situation if Jesus Christ had never assumed the headship of the church? But I'm telling you that that's the kind of situation that we have in many homes. Where the man does not have the courage, the knowledge, or whatever it might be, 
to fulfill the responsibility that God has given him, and that is the responsibility to assume the headship of that home and to be the kind of leader that God would have him be. The husband has a responsibility to provide for that home. First Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8 would certainly underline the fact that if he doesn't provide for his own, he's worse than an infidel and has denied the faith. He needs to understand that he has a responsibility of making the living. Someone said if the husband makes a living, the woman ought to make the living worthwhile. That may be true. But the husband has a responsibility of making the living. He needs to be an energetic and enthusiastic person. A person that has the energy to accomplish the responsibilities that God has given him. I've seen a lot of men that were lazy. I've seen a lot of men that when it came to providing for the home were purely no good at all. And because of that, many times homes have suffered and haven't been what God would have them be. I've seen men that provided very well for the home as far as making that which it took for the home to exist, but then they were so selfish that they squandered it on themselves. That equally is a violation of the instructions of God's law. And so a husband has a responsibility to provide for his wife. He has a responsibility to protect his wife. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25 shows the love and the concern that he has for her. A husband has a responsibility to continue courting his wife. In other words, to be the kind of person for that wife as he lived with her down through the years that he was when he was so energetically seeking her fair fortune and her love. Now you understand what I'm saying. I'm saying that you men need to keep the love of your life, your love of your wife, the same way that you won the love of your wife. Do you remember how that was? Do you remember how it was before you got married? It is the absence of these things that causes problems in the home. Do you remember how much time you spent with her before you married her? Do you remember how every waking moment you wanted to be with her where you could see her, touch her, hear her, talk to you or something? you remember that? Then you remember when you got married and that sort of wore off and all of a sudden you don't spend much time with her at all anymore. Or you come in, shower and eat, get your rest and go on your merry way. And oftentimes, two people who are separate individuals come together, learn to love one another, become married to one another, and then shortly afterwards drift apart like they were before they ever met. That's tragic. But I'm telling you, it creates an awful lot of problems in homes today. So sometimes when I'm at Bellevue and I'm talking about those kind of problems in the home, I, I tell the men, you men ought to spend some time with your wife. Take her fishing. <laughs> Take her hunting, Andrew. <laughs> you know, really, there, there was a husband. I remember a couple had this kind of problem. And uh, if they were growing apart. He liked to fish. She liked to get with her friends and play Scrabble. So they decided, look, we'll, we'll settle on something where we can compromise and spend some time together. And they decided to take up golf, Robert. And it wasn't very long till he immediately became an excellent golfer. Well, she came along very well and became a pretty good golfer in her own right. Finally, he even bought her her own set of custom-made clubs. They were out golfing one day. And you, you men, you've been in these kind of conversations before. You've had your wife ask you these questions. You don't know how in the world the question ever came about. But it did. And now you try to handle it. She says, uh, if I died first, would you get married again? <laughs> Well, he thought about that thing for a second. If any of you fellows ever had that question asked you, I don't think you were all that quick to answer it. He said, he was trying to be honest to his convictions. He said, well, I guess it would. That aggravated her. She said, well, would you sell a house or would you just let her live in my house? He said, well, it's a nice house. I built it. I like it. He said, never thought about it. I guess I'd just let her live there. That aggravated her a little more. You mean you let her move right in my kitchen? You know, you women are awful possessive about your kitchen. He said, well, yeah, guess what? I guess you'd give her the keys to my car, too, and just let her drive my car. He said, well, now that you mention that, I guess I would. She reached back and pulled one of those custom-made golf clubs out of the bag. She said, hey, I guess you'd even let her play with my golf clubs. He said, no, she's left-handed. <laughs> Any of you wise, all oh, that me address is a man. I've got more men in here than I do ladies. Do any of you 
do any of you men's wives still have some of the love letters you wrote her before you got married? Would you like for me to read some of those up here today? You said, no, I had a few sweet words in there that I don't really care for everyone in the world to know that I said it. I think that you ought to be kind and say some sweet things to her after you get married. You ought to spend some time with her, say some sweet things to her. You ought to be concerned about your appearance. I remember one gospel preacher, he said, men after they get married usually are not concerned about their appearance at all. He said one of the problems that he had noticed is that a man will go to work and work all day, be hot and dirty and sweaty, eat a hamburger with onions a half inch thick on the top of it, come home, belch and burp twice and expect to kiss on somebody. And he said you men ought to be concerned about your appearance after you married her, just like you were before you married her. I think that's right. You ought to give her some gifts sometimes. I gave my wife a shotgun for Christmas. <laughs> you ought to call her on the telephone sometime and talk to her and just tell her that you love her. I'll tell you what. There's not a one of you old boys out there that's married whose wife wouldn't appreciate you doing that sometime. You ought to remember. That's courting her, showing her that you love her. You need to honor and be considerate of her. Honor her by showing sympathy toward her. Honor her, as I just said, by spending some time with her. Honor her by showing some tenderness and affection to her. Honor her by being worthy of her. Honor her by being careful that you let her know that you appreciate her. I picked this up some time ago, and I like it. Some of you may have already read it somewhere else or heard someone say something about it. But there was a mother that had to spend some time away one day, and the father was left to take care of the children. Have any of you ever had to do that? You know, I, when you talk about appreciating the wife, and Robert has done an awful lot of writing and teaching on the home, Robert, if the husband would just walk in the footsteps of the wife just an hour or two, not a day or two, but if he just walk in her footsteps for a little while, he learned to appreciate her. Well, this man was keeping the children while mother was away, and he was an accountant. And you know how accountants always meticulously remember everything, or at least take notes. And so when she got back, here was a note that was pinned to the refrigerator, or with a magnet to the refrigerator. Look at it. He says, dried tears, nine times. Tied shoes, 13 times. Toy balloons purchased, three each. Average life expectancy of the toy balloon, 13 seconds. <laughs> Caution not to cross the street, 21 times. Numbers of time cross the street, 21 times. <laughs> Number of times I'll do this again, zero. And all I'm saying is that you men need to show honor to your wife, and one way you can show honor to her is by being considerate of her and showing her that you appreciate her. That wife has mental needs, she has emotional needs, she has physical needs, she has spiritual needs. I wish I had time to stop and talk about every one of those, I don't. But you men need to be considerate of that wife and understand that. You need to value her. One of the best ways in the world that you might ever value your wife is to take some time and read through the book of Proverbs and mark those passages that show the worth of a worthy woman. And of course, particularly when you get to the end of the book and read the last chapter. As I said, you need to be sweet and tender to her. I've got a lot of instructions written down here for women, for their husbands. Let me just go over two or three for you ladies who are here present. One of the responsibilities that a woman have, has is to honor and respect her husband. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 33. She can do that by fulfilling her obligations at home. She can do that by being in subjection to that husband. She does that by wearing his name. She can do that by avoiding criticizing him in public. She can do that by being careful that she never dominates him. Now, we have another word for that, and I think the word dominate comes to Dominic or hen, and then we talked about hen pecking. And one thing that a woman ought to be careful to do is that you never hen peck your husband. And I have seen men that were just that way. They looked like a little poodle dog led around with a six-foot leash around their neck. And they were afraid to do anything, anything, until they first of all talked to mama at home. Sometimes we joke about a man wanting to go out to play golf or go fishing, that he has to get a house pass. And sometimes you might make plans for him to go fishing, and he'll say, well, I'm not going to be able to go. And he just is a little slow in telling you why. 
because he couldn't get a house pass to get away for that particular day or that particular time. I remember a man that had been married. He's married to that kind of woman that had dominated him all of his life, and he'd never been able to do anything, you know, without her approval. When he when he got paid, he he paid, he came home, endorsed the check, and gave it to her. She gave him his allowance, and then checked his billfold each night to be sure he was spending his money properly. Finally, she died, and it wasn't but about six days until he married again. And he was downtown and saw one of his friends. One of his friends said to him, "said Bob, I hear you got married again." He said, "It sure did." He said, well, what in the world is Matilda going to think about that? Matilda was a former wife. He said, I don't really care what she thinks about it, if she knows about it. He said, well, I remember her saying that if she died first and you married again, that she'd scratch out of her grave and come back and haunt you the rest of the days of your life. He said, yes, yeah, she did. He said, well, doesn't that bother you? He said, no, it doesn't. He said, well, why? He said, well, he said, there's one simple fact. He said, I buried her face down, and as she's scratching, she's getting deeper all the time. <laughs> a, wife, a wife has a responsibility to submit to and to obey her husband. I have some women, when you preach on the submission of the wife to the husband, there's some ladies that become a little perturbed, and they say, you mean to tell me that I'm to be submissive unto him as Christ, as the church is unto Jesus Christ? That's right. And then they begin to tell me about the kind of husband that they have. And I guess somewhere along the line we men ought to understand that a woman would never have one problem in all of this world. As a matter of fact, it would be the easiest thing she ever did to be in subjection to her husband if the husband loved her the way Christ loved the church. And I think that principle says a lot to us men as well as to the ladies. She has a responsibility to bear children. There have been a lot of homes that have been destroyed because the wife was far more concerned about her own personal career than she was in being the kind of person that God had, had legislated for her to be. She needs to be a person that's domestically oriented. She needs to be a person that's industrious and seeks to live within her own income. We sometimes turn to 1 Timothy 5, 8, as I did a few moments ago, and say the man that doesn't provide for the family is sinning, but what about the woman that wastes the provision? And so wives need to be industrious and frugal and careful as they use the funds that the husband has made. I'd say to you ladies that you also have the responsibility to keep yourself attractive and in good health for your husband, that you have the responsibility to maintain your femininity. I don't guess I ever say anything about a husband and wife that I don't pause somewhere along the line to say that there's nothing in this world that's any more tr attractive to a man than a woman that looks and acts like a woman. And I'm telling you, she needs to look like a woman, she needs to act like a woman, smell like one too, and as is very attractive to a man. Keep your femininity. And another thing that a woman can do that can make the home something that gels and stays together and becomes stronger as the years go by is to pay attention, ladies, to some of the little things. A good friend of mine, a man that I've known for, oh, 30 years or more, a member of the church and a very popular musician in the country music field, um, Sonny Loden, you know him as Sonny James, wrote a song several years ago back in the early 60s, perhaps it was 62, and one of the lines in that song goes like this. The way you fix my coffee in the morning, the way you fix my tie before I go, the hurried kiss I get from you when I'm leaving, it's the little things that make me love you so. You ladies, you pay attention to the little things, and it'll help build the kind of home that you ought to have. Well, I had written down some instructions for both husband and wife. I don't think I really have time to go through those, but I would want to pause and say that one of those things that I have there is the responsibility that the husband and wife has to put one another first. We do a lot of preaching about putting the kingdom first. That's right. But when it comes to that relationship in the home, the husband and the wife needs to learn to not be selfish, but needs to learn to give of themselves. Someone says 50-50, or oh, why not 60-40? Why not try to be careful to give more than you ask, to give more than you receive, to be concerned about her? Some wives feel like uh, they don't really count. You've heard ladies say, well, I just feel like I'm just a, a thing, that I'm just a fixture, that my husband doesn't really care anything about me like he once did. And I think some of them have a right to feel that way. You know, after all, 
Uh, he has his parents that he spends a lot of time with. He has his children. He has his job. He has his fishing partners, his golf buddies, his hunting buddies, uh, the football games, the baseball games, the basketball games, and on and on and on it goes. And if there's ever anything left over, he even has her. You can understand how they feel. And then sometimes the men feel that way. Because after all, you know, she has her home to take care of and her children and her project and her this and her that. And if there's ever any time left over, she actually gets down, sit down and talk to him every once in a while. Maybe five minutes at a time, twice a week. But she still has some time to talk to him. That kind of thing destroys homes. Wives and husbands can be very guilty of that. They need to be concerned about putting one another first. They need to be concerned, I must say this before I pass, they need to be concerned about being faithful to one another. When I opened that testament up to Ephesians 5, and I began reading about the relationship between the husband and the wife, there's at least three things that stand out. The first one is the sacredness of subjection. She is to be subject to her husband. The husband is to love her as he loves his own body, as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. It's a sacred principle that's to be maintained in the home. There is the preciousness of purity. Yes, she's to keep herself pure for him. She is married to him and to him only, and it is to him that she is to devote her life. But yes, he is also to keep himself pure for her. And thus that purity is precious. The oneness and the closeness is there. Have you ever seen a couple that's lived together 40, 50, or 60 years, and the man or the wife say, I love her more now than I did when I married her? That's the way it must and should be. Because you grow together, not apart, when you grow the way God would have you grow. And then there's that consecrated closeness that's there, as I've just been talking about. So they need to be careful that they're faithful to one another and to help one another go to heaven. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 16. In the final few minutes that I have, let me say something about the purpose of the home. The purpose of the home would naturally be the propagation of the human race. We certainly have responsibilities there in rearing children and training those children as the kind of young people that they ought to be so that they grow up to be the citizens of society and members of the Lord's church that God would have them be. We certainly have responsibilities, and one of the purposes of the home is to avoid immorality. Another purpose of the home, I only have time to mention these, is to increase the number saved. Another purpose of the home is obviously one that I've just been talking about, to provide such wonderful companionship one for another. And another purpose, and one I want to spend a couple minutes on, is the purpose to teach and impress great spiritual lessons. Let's read a verse or two. First of all, I want you to, to look with me at Psalm 103 in verse 13. Notice these comparisons that are here. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. Where does a child learn, learn that kind of compassion? A child learns that kind of compassion in the home. A child ought to have the good fortune. They deserve growing up in a home where that kind of compassion is demonstrated. I'm afraid a lot of times a lot of us simply do not understand or do not appreciate that. Several years ago, oh, perhaps in the early 50s, communist China then decided that one of the problems that they were having with their people was the fact that children were being reared under the influence of parents. And so they took children away from parents and reared them in a commune where they knew no such parent-child relationship. And when they grew up, the reading that I read on it said that they wound up having to destroy those people because they absolutely had no concern for anyone else. Why? Because they'd never been taught that love and that compassion in the home where it's to be taught. Here's another verse. This one's in, uh, in Isaiah chapter 66 and verse 13. As, who, as one whom his mother comforteth, so will I comfort you, and you should be comforted in Jerusalem. I wish I had some time to stop and talk about that verse. But as a mother takes a child into her loving arms and comforts that child, that in a small way is at least a reflection of the comfort that we have in the arms of God. And where do you learn that kind of lesson? You learn that kind of lesson in the home. When you turn to Ephesians 5, and perhaps you might want to turn here, I want to underline several verses for you for just a moment. But in Ephesians chapter 5, a passage that we've just been talking about, 
that deals with the relationship of the husband and the wife. Look at these. Look at verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Where do we learn that kind of relationship and learn to respect that kind of relationship in the home? Uh, look at verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. It ought to mean something to an infant or to a child, a three-year-old, a five-year-old, a seven-year-old to say, as your mommy and daddy love one another, so does Christ love the church. But I'm afraid that phrase would be totally meaningless to a lot of young people. And where do young people learn that kind of love? They learn it in the home. So up in verse 28, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. Look at verse 29. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. Look at verse 33. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself. Where do we learn those kind of tremendous eternal lessons? We learn those kind of lessons in the home. Again, one of the great lessons that's learned in the home that you and I need to be concerned about is the fact that in the home we teach respect and knowledge and responsibility toward the Word of God. I want you to read with me for a couple of moments and notice some of these passages. We'll start out in 1 Timothy. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, in verses 3 and 4, pick up, well, start with the first of the verse. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Neither give heed to fables and endless, endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith. So do. A responsibility, Paul. What is it? That Timothy charge men not to teach any other doctrine. Now come to the end of the book. As he begins the book, so does he conclude the book. Because in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 20, he says, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so-called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. That first phrase in verse 20, where he says, O Timothy, keep that which is committed unto thy trust, might very well be translated, O Timothy, guard the deposit. He starts the book out by saying, charge men that they teach another doctrine. He concludes the book by saying, guard the deposit. We have a tremendous responsibility to be faithful to the book. Now come to 2 Timothy. Because it's in 2 Timothy that we can make our point. In 2 Timothy, starting in verse 5. But when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and am persuaded in thee also. Turn the page to chapter 3 in verse 15. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Now, Timothy knew those scriptures, had respect for those scriptures. It was something that had been in his grandmother, his mother before him. It was something that he had been taught from his youth up. I'm saying that there is a heritage that we need to leave our children. We sometimes talk about national heritage. Man, there needs to be something said about respect for the flag in this nation. We talk about, we talk about family heritage. There needs to be said something about the respect for our forefathers. But when are we going to say something about our spiritual heritage? A man that's part of my family, though I guess you'd call him first cousin once removed. It just, just happens to be family. About 90 years of age died this past November. He had six children. One son's a gospel preacher. One son's an elder. And all four daughters are married to elders in the Lord's church. Every one of them are sound, faithful to the word. The kind of people that you would respect. When the body was prepared and the family went in for that first private viewing before the public was allowed to come, one of the grandchildren saw Grandpa lying there in the casket and turned and said to his daddy, which was the son of the deceased, said, Daddy, you reckon we could get the funeral director to put a Bible in Grandpa's hand? And then in colloquial Alabama English, he said, he just don't look natural without it. Isn't that something? Is that the kind of heritage you're leaving your children, your grandchildren? 
I wonder what a lot of them would say about us. He just doesn't look natural without a what in his hand. He said, Grandpa doesn't look natural without a Bible in his hand. We have an awesome responsibility to teach and train our people and our young people respect for God's Word. So you come to 2 Timothy chapter 4. What does he say to Timothy? Preach the Word. Do what, Timothy? Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. And the man that will do what Paul told Timothy to do in 2 Timothy 4 is the man that had the Word taught him from his youth up that came to him and that heritage was instilled in him from the time that he was just a babe in arms. That's the kind of man that will have no problem with 2 Timothy chapter 4. You back up with me. It's in Jeremiah 23. Jeremiah 23 and 28, God through the prophet Jeremiah said, The prophet that hath a dream, let him tell a dream. Is that all? No. And he that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. Faithfully. Therefore, brethren, we have the responsibility to treat God's word reverently. In Nehemiah 8 and 5, when the word of God was read, the people out of respect stood. Do we have that kind of respect? We need to study it diligently. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15, put forth effort to come to a knowledge of God's word. We need to obey it fully. And to go beyond the principles and precepts of God is to lose our fellowship with him. 2 John verse 9. We need to teach it faithfully. Jeremiah 23 and verse 28. I've got a family, a wife and four children. Gene and I are doing everything that we can to train those children properly in God's Word. I've got one that's about ready to leave the nest. She just turned 20, fixing to graduate from the University of West Florida. I hate to see her go. Don't know if I'm ready for it. But I do hope one thing. I do hope and pray to my God in heaven that we've taught her, that we've trained her, that we've set the example before her so that when she leaves home, she doesn't leave the church. So that in the days and years to come, she shall always be, as she is now, a faithful and energetic servant of God. And let me tell you something. If for popularity, if to please a husband, if to make more money, if whatever the case might be, if Kathy should leave the church, it would destroy me, and it would divide our family. And brethren, we are the family of God. And when men, for whatever the cause might be, leave the faith, it, it divides God's family. There are men that have left the faith. L let me give you an example or two. We have men that call themselves gospel preachers that aren't even sure that the Bible is verbally inspired. We have men that call themselves gospel preachers that aren't even sure that the first few chapters of Genesis can really be taken literally. We have men that are supposed to be gospel preachers that are no longer sure whether fallible man can ever be right. We have men that are call themselves gospel preachers that aren't sure that we understand Matthew 19 and 1 Corinthians 7. As a matter of fact, some of them think that if we withdrew fellowship from anyone who teaches false doctrine, as we consider false doctrine in Matthew 19, 1 Corinthians 7, that one of these days we may have to tread water on it because we may find out we're wrong right now. I don't believe that for a second. We have men among us that will divide the assembly to produce what they call a children's church or training for Bible hour. We have men that would not teach the doctrine of the Christian church, but yet they would tell you that they would accept into their fellowship people from the Christian church if those people would agree not to teach that doctrine. That's tragic. And listen to me carefully. I want to be as kind as I can possibly be. We have some men scheduled to appear on this lectureship who have defended some of those very doctrines I just enumerated. And I don't want you to mistakenly interpret my presence on this lectureship as an endorsement of those doctrines or the men who propagate them. May the time come 
when we can hate every false way and refuse to encourage those who support that which is false. Take God's word as our guide. And when we take God's word as our guide, then we can build the home the way God would have us build it. And the problems can then be cared for. May God bless you.